Good afternoon and welcome to the School Education Gateway webinar on blended learning, creating your unique blend. Before we start, I would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and it might be used for dissemination purposes. Uh, today we will talk about the concept of blended learning and what it might look like for teachers and learning and learners. And uh, moving from theory to practice, the discussion will focus on the need to plan for blended learning and design blends that are fit for different contexts. Um, but, and to start, uh, we have the honor to have with us a very special guest. And I would like to introduce to you uh, the European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth, Maria Gabriel. Commissioner, thank you so much for choosing to be with us this afternoon. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, it's a real pleasure for me to be here together with you and it's a honor to open this webinar. So allow me to start immediately uh, by saying that blended learning will be the theme of the month on the school education gateway. And this is also a theme that raises many questions still, but many opportunities too. So it is through exploring, brainstorming and exchanging best practices that we can effectively bring these opportunities into the everyday life of pupils and teachers. And it is through meetings like this one that we can make real progress towards achieving the European education area by 2025. So the digital transformation in education is indeed at the heart of our policies. And here I will talk immediately to our new digital education action plan because with the digital education action plan, we want to provide a new comprehensive approach to digital learning and education at the European level. And the strategic priorities of the plan allow us to respond to two main pressing needs. First, the need to improve and extend the use of digital technologies to improve teaching and learning practices. And blended learning is an example of how we can do this. And second, we need to equip all learners with the digital knowledge, skills and attitudes to live, to work, learn and thrive in a world increasingly mediated by digital technologies. And addressing those two aspects of digital education requires policies and actions, both at national and European level. And this webinar is an example of what I think is one of the most valuable tools we have at European level to effectively contribute to the development of quality and inclusive education and training. And I really count on you to propose ideas and solutions so that together we can achieve our goals. And yes, it is easy to see the many benefits that a smart mix of different tools and methods, what we call blended learning, can bring both to teachers and learners. The combination of IT tools from mobile digital devices to artificial intelligence with books, science equipment and arts, allows a better and more effective way to nurture children, children's personality and creativity. In other words, if used effectively, and you know that better than me, blended learning can make the best of both worlds. In fact, through technology, pupils can access, create and share digital content in a much more engaging and collaborative way and this stimulates and supports their autonomy. And through the physical experience of visiting a museum, a scientific research center, an engineering lab or local parks and forests, children can establish a direct link between theory and practice. And teenagers can get a direct outlook on the different professions on a variety of fields. And I see that the School Education Gateway has already published successful examples of blended learning approaches, for example, to cater for all those children who cannot physically attend school in class because they are sick or following parents on traveling professions. And blended learning can contribute to include more pupils into the education system by providing the flexibility they need. 
And this is fully in line with what we want to achieve, given that inclusion is one of the Commission's priority. And I cannot accept still today in the European Union that one in five young people does not reach appropriate levels of competencies in reading, mathematics or science. That early leavers from education and training still represent 10.2% of young people in the European Union. And we know that unfortunately, socioeconomic background continues to be one of the strongest determinants of educational outcomes. And we can and we must do more to give all children a chance to succeed in their digital education. And flexible approaches are essential to achieve that goal. And I do not need to tell you what challenges the COVID-19 brought to our education systems. I see the resilience and the strength you have shown for the past year in adapting to an unprecedented situation and being as present as you could for your students. And I know that you can also be parents yourselves and you need both to be present for your students and your own children who might have to stay at home because of school closures. Your work and commitment in this time has been exceptional and I will continue to repeat that not only now because that's the situation, but we have always to remind your extraordinary engagement, creativity and mobilization. And allow me here to say too that we have also seen that alternative ways of teaching come with difficulties. The recent experience showed that many schools, educators, pupils and parents were unprepared somehow in terms of digital competencies, connectivity, resources and infrastructure. And I always have in mind this study conducted by the OECD in 2018 before the crisis that we have these 40 percent of our educators that are not feeling themselves well or very well prepared for using digital technologies in their daily work. So I think that we have to use this situation as an opportunity because that's not anymore the case. We all have seen how it was extraordinary, the access to these digital technologies, the use of them. And I think that what, what is important is really to, to, to use these good examples that we all have seen during the last one year. And at the same time, it's true that there is teachers that need to have better access to those digital technologies, to trainings. And that's why count on my support too, that together with our digital education action plan to continue to ensure support via targeted actions and funding to increase these digital skills for teachers and students. And I think that here with the framework at our digital education action plan, we have this range of actions to support member states and educators increase the basic digital skills and competencies. And I will continue to, to work together with all of you and our member states in order this time to seize the momentum in order to have real investment in this, because that's not anymore our future. You are our present. And in this context, I would like to, to make an announcement. In a few months, uh, we'll propose a council recommendation on online and distance learning in primary and secondary education as part of the Digital Education Action Plan. And of course, always uh, we are hoping that this recommendation will help develop a shared vision and understanding at European level of the approaches needed for learning environments and tools that are effective, inclusive and engaging. And of course, I count on you in order to define and to have positive actions based on previous research and emerging evidence from across Europe. But especially what I would like to see is practical examples, examples of blended learning model to demonstrate how the effective use of different environments and tools might be supported. And of course, we'll also encourage our member states to provide guidance to school directors, teachers and families on top of the many resources and opportunities provided by us, such as the School Education Gateway, eTwinning and Erasmus Plus Mobility and Cooperation Projects. 
Additional funding, of course, will be available in the framework of the Resilience and Recovery Facility. But here, I think that we should all stay, continue to be very mobilized because not all our member states are presenting their national plans with the right level of investment that we would like to see in that. What, what I would like to see now coming from our member states is how to join words and actions because it's time to do it. And uh, yes, finally, what, what I would like to, to say is that I count very much on you. It's really important that we continue to explore and support synergies, synergies between school education and higher education, between education, culture and sport to promote blended learning where it can make a positive difference to young people. And support for organizing events like this one will also remain on our agenda as we believe that the sharing of practices can help schools across Europe to create meaningful and inclusive learning opportunities. So again, thank you very much for joining this webinar today. I'm sure you will engage in fruitful discussions that will bring new knowledge and new perspective to your work. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for being with us for again for choosing to be with us today and uh, for the insightful and motivating opening of this session also and for the great news that are coming up. So we are very excited to see what is coming up for all um, the community of teachers and educators. So let's continue with this webinar. But before we continue, I would like to remind you that at the end of this session, we will have a moment for questions and answers. Unfortunately, the commissioner cannot stay with us the whole time, but we will have um, Hannah Clemson from the European Commission available to answer all your questions. So please do not hesitate to uh, pose your questions and let's engage in a very interesting conversation at the end of this session, OK? Um, for the questions, uh, you can also find in the webinar page a Padlet where you can post your questions there or you can just use the chat function here on this live session. And now I have the pleasure to introduce our, ne our next guest speaker, Michael Hallisey uh, from H2 Learning. Michael is a former primary teacher and national uh, ICT advisor in, uh, in Ireland who has worked in the field of digital education for over 25 years. He's currently working with educators across all levels in designing and implementing engaging online and blended learning experiences. Michael, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be here with us and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Rufa, and uh, uh, great to hear the Commissioner and great to uh, hear her um, speak um, to us today. So that's really great. I hope you can see my slides. And um, yes, so I, I will kick off because I, I have a lot to say and not very much time to say it. So um, the the title of today's presentation is blended learning, uh, creating your own unique blend, and hopefully that will become clearer. And I suppose the key messages that I want to try and cover today are I want to start by looking at emergency remote teaching and just why it's different from blended learning. Uh, I really want to echo what the Commissioner has said about the new array of knowledge and skills that our teachers all across Europe have developed and how we can uh, move that forward by providing them with opportunities to develop this knowledge um, further. I also want to make the point that blended learning is not a new, new idea, but it is a contested one, and we really need to figure out what it means in our context, and uh, that means that we need um, educators like yourselves to make those decisions. And ultimately, it's about helping teachers design good learning experiences for their learners and to capture and to share those. I think the sharing of practice is key and that we learn from each other because it's such a big area. So. I'm going to base my presentation around this um, infographic that I and a number of colleagues, Professor Deirdre Butler in the Institute of Education in Dublin City University and my uh, partner in, um, in H2 Learning, John Hurley, have developed. And we have created this timeline called BC, DC and AC. And I want to quickly look at BC very quickly. And then I want to focus on DC, which is during COVID and AC, which is after COVID and where I see huge opportunities for blended learning. So we all know this, um, but it's no harm to remind ourselves that before COVID, uh, everything 
pretty much took place in a school, in a classroom or in a school building or in a school grounds. Um, and then during COVID, everything stopped from the classroom was taken away from us. So the environment uh, where um, instruction, teaching, learning uh, was taking place and we moved to this thing called remote instruction. And all of a sudden our homes uh, became places, busy places that where they were supporting teachers working, they were supporting parents working, uh, teachers were, were, were involved in teaching and uh, also young people were involved in learning. So they became very, very uh, busy places and not all of them were as neat and tidy and as spacious as the one that I have in the picture. There were challenges for many people um, in finding suitable spaces. And this thing called distance learning arrived and we had lots of different models emerging. Uh, this is a cartoon from the United States and uh, it captures there was some in-person teaching and people with masks. There was some virtual where young people were on machines and then there was the virtually impossible where some people got lost and they struggled and um, it was not a very nice experience. But in all of this, uh, we this this phase and I, we're still in it um, has been called many things, but I prefer to use the terminology emergency remote uh, teaching. And it's worth remembering that it is different from online learning, and I'll show you that in a minute, from virtual learning and distance learning. And in the main, because well-planned online learning experiences are meaningfully different from courses offered in online in response to a crisis or a disaster because we didn't really have that much time and even though during the summer people um, retooled, they uh, upskilled and they made some adjustments, we didn't have control of all of the elements um, uh, during the school year. And when I contrast emergency remote teaching with two projects that I have been involved in myself uh, where we had time to plan, I can see these big differences. And one of these projects is a project we have in Ireland. It's called uh, the Gaeltacht eHub project. And in Ireland, we have our own language. It's um, the Irish language, and it's spoken predominantly on the West Coast. And you can see um, in yellow there uh, areas where the language is spoken. And they had a problem that they had a shortage of teachers. So our Department of Education trained up teachers to set up an online school where they uh, were prepared, the schools were prepared, we trained up the, we gave the young people supports, it was very well planned and I contrast that very much with ERT where people on one day were in a classroom and on the next they were working from home. Another example of a project that I've been involved in, I was involved in this project called iSchool which is for young people uh, young teenagers who are out of school um, and it was designed to reconnect them with school and in that project we again put a lot of time and effort into the design supporting um, the teachers. Uh, we have mentors with the young learners um, and they learn in centres and they learn online as well and they learn outside in the environment. So it's a very planned and a very different to what happened during emergency remote teaching. And we all know that there were lots of challenges around emergency remote teaching. And again, like the commissioner, I'm not going to dwell on these, but there were issues with access. There was issues around digital competencies. There were issues around motivation for some learners and, for en and, and around engagement. And despite all of that, there has been a tremendous array of innovative practice that has been displayed by teachers all across Europe. On Saturday, just two days ago, I had the opportunity to participate in an online conference organised um, in Ireland called Enhancing Teaching and Learning Post Pandemic. And I heard from lots of teachers of the wonderful work they did. And one of them actually, I've just got a slide on it there on screen, captured a really innovative blend of where a teacher who was teaching English, he was teaching Romeo and Juliet, uh, got the boys in his school to write with a pen, old technology, uh, to a girls' school, their Romeo and Juliet letters, and then they upload them digitally uh, to their classroom and they share them. And it was a really um, fantastic experience for everybody, got everybody motivated and it gave them um, a chance to work off screen as well. But it was a lovely blend and there's so many more um, examples of that all across Europe and like the Commissioner, we need to capture these. Also, another teacher shared with me uh, earlier today, a um, our in schools inspectorate have been involved in an evaluation of practices 
among teachers and schools during the emergency remote teaching. And this uh, school, uh, when their students were asked how they enjoyed the emergency remote teaching, they said that they liked it on three fronts, that it was structured, it was organised and it was achievable. So despite all of the challenges, there is lots of good practice coming out of um, the emergency remote teaching. And one of the biggest ones is that teachers have learned to use an array of digital technologies. I like to think of the, the array of digital technologies uh, when I started out was quite small. You could count them on one hand, but now there are so many and teachers over the last 12 months have learned how to use new tools nearly on a weekly basis. And this, this is something that uh, we call uh, technology knowledge. And they've learned how to use many of the tools that I have on the screen here. And in addition to that, they have also used older technologies. Some of them have put learning packs together, which they have sent out to students. And we've even seen um, a return of television to help our students to learn. And this the knowledge of these tech these tools in in is known as our technological knowledge and I'm going to use a framework I promise this is about the only uh, uh, academic piece of the of the talk but it's technological knowledge and it's a very important piece and it's the functional knowledge of how to use digital uh, technology but it's only one part of the picture and we also need to remember that we need to remember our pedagogical knowledge, how to teach a particular subject or a particular area of the curriculum and our content knowledge. And when we put those three together, we get this thing called TPAC and I call it hitting the bullseye and it's technological pedagogical content knowledge. And I think at the moment there is an opportunity for us to build on the TK that teachers have developed over the last 12 months and to really move forward with this now and develop new blends. And all of these blends will be relevant to the context in which teachers are working. So I'm sure in most countries, um, you know, many of you are now returning to school. And the question is, so what are we going to keep from emergency remote teaching and what may get lost? Uh, example, my own uh, son went back to school today and today is the day where 350,000 pupils in Ireland have returned to school. So we now have to ask ourselves the questions, what are we going to keep and what's going to get lost? And I want to look back even a little further before I before we answer that. And when we look back to previous pandemics and this uh, slide shows uh, some screens from 1918 and the flu pandemic in the United States, we learn that Teachers even back then were using the technologies of their day. They were using newspapers and they were using um, cinema uh, film. But also in the picture on the right, you can see that they were learning outside, out the different environments. They were out in the open air. And this is something that uh, came out, one of the positives that came out of that particular pandemic. And when we look even further on, we see that there has been a role for technology in supporting remote instruction. Going back to the polio pandemic in the 30s, there has been use of television and there has even been use of telephones um, when young people were in hospital. So remote instruction has been there for a long time. Unfortunately, when people have come back in to school after these, these uh, pandemics, Oftentimes the technology gets lost, so we need to make sure this time around that we take a constructive approach to ensuring that the knowledge that teachers have developed and the practices that students have enjoyed are, in, are allowed to continue. And I think this is where blended learning comes in. And now I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk about blended learning and to, uh, to give you some uh, um, ideas, I suppose, around what it could be um, uh, in, in, our, in our own in 2021. First thing I have to say is that it's not a new idea. And the idea of blended learning uh, has been around um, since the early noughties. And it is an idea that originally developed uh, in the world of learning and development in industry. And then it made its way into higher education. And it focused a lot in the early days on a very narrow focus between online uh, use of the internet and face-to-face -face classrooms. And even in the early days, people weren't that happy with it. In the, in the world of schools, 
Um, there has been some work done on it, um, but there's definitely need for more. And this book that I have here on the slide, uh, Blended Using Disruptive Innovation to Improve Schools, uh, was written by Michael Horn and Heather Staker in 2015. And here again, the, the internet is very much to the fore in the, in the uh, definition, and it says blended learning is any formal education program in which a student learns at least in part through online learning with some element of student control over time, place, path and our pace. And this this the last piece of this, I think, is really important that and this was uh, has come out in during the emergency remote teaching that actually students have enjoyed the fact that they have control over time, place, path and our pace. But I would suggest, like others, that maybe we can go even beyond just the online. Um, it's more than that. And I really like um, the definition from the School Education Gateway uh, guideline document, which says blended learning is understood as a hybrid approach that combines learning in school with distance learning, comma, including online learning. So it's much more expansive and distance learning there can include those environments, can include learning out in the open air, it can include going to museums, uh, you name it. It's a much more inclusive uh, form of learning that uh, you know takes into account the context uh, of what the students are learning and where they're learning. So what I want to say to you is that there is no one size fits all definition of blended learning. You may think, oh, that's a problem. No, I would argue it is not. It is actually an opportunity for you to use the tools, the spaces at your disposal to create blends that actually fit for your context and particularly for your students. And in blended learning, we we always have to remember that we, particularly for this group, that we have two, two big cohorts to look at. We have primary and we have secondary. And some of the blends that may work at secondary, and I'll share some of those in a few minutes, may not work at primary and vice versa. So context is very, very important in designing the blends that we are going to develop. And now I'm going to look AC after COVID, and I'm going to look at when we are back and when we are back in our physical spaces and when we can fully implement blended learning because uh, at the moment we are curtailed in what we can do. And again, like the commissioner, I am going to refer to the policy and the Digital Education Action Plan, which is a really good document and there are it's been really uh, well developed, very thoughtful and it's resetting education and training for the digital age. And there are two key priorities within it. Uh, one is the fostering the development of a high performing digital education ecosystem and the other is enhancing digital skills and competencies for the digital transformation. So when I spoke earlier about TK, that was probably under a strategic priority too. But all of this is leading to a council recommendation on online and distance learning for primary and secondary education. And this is going to happen as we heard this year, and its aim is to support education systems to develop lens of different learning environments and tools that are effective, inclusive and engaging. And I think this is now where we are all focusing on at this time. So to do that, I believe that we need teachers as professionals who are making decisions around designing blended learning experiences for their learners. Again, referring back to the TPAC framework, which was developed by Mishra and Kohler, it's very much grounded in this idea of the professional knowledge of the teacher, that specialised knowledge that they make decisions around how they are going to combine the technological knowledge with the pedagogical knowledge and the content knowledge and applying that for their learners. So with that in mind, I think I know it's early in the day, but I think of the idea of blending and I think of the blending of gin. OK, I don't think of food blending uh, because I think sometimes you can't when you blend something in a food blender, uh, the bits become a little bit too small. So I like the idea of the botanical and with uh, my colleague Deirdre Butler, we have come up with this idea that you, depending on the botanicals and the measures that you mix, you get a blend and you get unique blends depending on how you put the blend together. 
And there are three, at least three areas that we need to think about when we are putting our blend together. So the first one is, where does our will learning take place? And we need to consider, are we a blend that's going to fit for our students? And we need to consider, what are we going to do with our learners when we have them back in school, in the physical spaces? And I should probably even extrapolate that out even further and put in when we have them out uh, with us on field trips or if they are out in the open air and if they're working in the school, learning in the school garden or visiting a forest or wherever. So in those physical spaces, right? That's the first thing we think about. What are we going to do there? The second uh, modality or space is live online. This has really come to the fore over the last 12 months. This time last year, I'm sure many of you had never heard of Zoom or maybe even Teams or uh, Google Meet or Google Hangouts. These are now everyday uh, technologies that teachers are using with their learners. And the question is, how are we going to use these in the future? Or are we going to use them in the future? And are we maybe going to use these tools so that some of our learners, if they're not in school, can join us um, on a daily basis? Or are we going to use these live online spaces so that experts can come in and visit us and we can have conversations with them? It's, 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 these, these online events could be very active events. They don't need to be uh, passive just one way. And then we have this other area over here on the right, which is self-directed. And that, again, is, is not a new idea. Um, and it's where learners maybe go off on their own or they can go off in pairs or in teams to work on uh, projects on their own. They can do homework, etc., etc. And this is something that came to the fore a lot uh, during um, the emergency remote teaching and actually we're starting a new Erasmus Plus um, project um, this week uh, with uh, colleagues in Flanders looking at this whole area of self-directed learning. So these are these are this is the where so we need to think about that. That's the first thing we need to think about. Then the next decisions we have are around how learning takes place and for this I'm being heavily influenced by the work of uh, Professor Diana Laurie-Lard and her colleagues in University College London and they developed a thing called the ABC framework and I and my colleagues have taken it and we have adapted it um, even more and uh, they focus on six learning types and these six learning types are as follows acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice and production and we have added into the mix social and emotional well-being and us assessment opportunities, because we all know that assessment, particularly summative assessment, has been uh, turned on its head in the last uh, 12 months. So this 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 uh, framework is based on Diana Laurie Laird's um, work around uh, the conversational framework, and she envisages that in any learning event, we should have a blend of these learning types. And it may not all happen in the one um, sitting or the one uh, period, but over the course of a number of uh, sessions or interactions with your learners that you would use all six of these. So there would be some element of acquisition. There would be opportunities for collaboration and collaboration is typically combined with discussion, uh, etc. So these are the and this is the core actually of what we are looking at, the learning types um, that we want to create. And only then should we start to think about the technologies, the how. So on this slide here, we have created what we call the Teach Nimble um, wheel, tech wheel. And for each of those six learning types, we have identified some tools that could help you to implement a uh, one of those learning types. So for example, if you want to do acquisition, you might share a YouTube video with your learners uh, before you meet them and you might ask them to, uh, you know, uh, look out for something in the in the YouTube video and then when you meet them uh, in class, you would spend more of your time on discussion. So these are some of the tools. It's not a definitive list by any matter of means, but it's just giving people some ideas on what is possible. And of course, I still have on the left hand side those older technologies. So these two need to be in our blend. They need to be in our mix. And a model that I particularly like around blended learning and one that I see in Ireland is coming to the fore, particularly um, in uh, secondary education 
is the flipped classroom model. And again, this was covered um, in the uh, school education gateway um, guidelines. And this this is the in their in their document, they call it the, the three event uh, model. So the before event. So what will you do with the learners before you meet them? And that is often it's self-directed online discussion, self-assessment. You can check to see level of understanding before you meet the learners. And oftentimes there can be acquisition in here as well. And then when you come to the live session, it is less about uh, sharing content, but it's more about dialogue, deliberation, collaboration and sharing. And then there tends to be uh, an after event afterwards as well, where the learners may have to go and do some practice and production and some consolidation of their learning. And what this what this requires is for the teacher to make decisions. What will I do in advance? What will we do during the live session? And what will I get the ask the learners to do afterwards? And this then produces opportunities for learning design. And this is some new ideas that uh, I and colleagues have been working on, and it's based on on work out of Australia, uh, um, Alamary and, and colleagues, and it's this idea of the three different types of blends and the first one we call is a low impact blend and that is adding extra activities to an existing course or program and again I'm seeing a lot of evidence of this at the moment and this might be where a teacher adds a Kahoot quiz to their class for formative assessment purposes and and they they add it they and they use it then to see if the students understood what was covered and if not they make changes uh, to their teaching and they uh, they help those students that were struggling so that's a low impact blend and i just want to say that just because it's a low and it's a low impact blend on the teacher so there's not a lot of work required on the part of the teacher so it's a really nice way to help teachers to actually start to use uh, technology with their students. But a low impact blend, such as the one I have just described, can have a very high impact on student learning. The second type is a medium impact blend, and that is where you replace an activity that you have in an existing course or a program um, with, with something else. So here it might be that a teacher would record a presentation, which lots of you did during uh, the emergency remote teaching, in advance of a face to face session. And then you ask your learners to access it in advance and you might even ask them some questions. You might embed some questions into the activity. So they've they're doing their homework before they come to class and then the face to face classroom session is shorter and it's focused more on discussion and deliberation flipped classroom. So that's a medium impact blend. And again, the it's a medium impact on the teacher and on the school. And then we have a third kind of blend. And this is building the blended course from scratch. And here a blended course is, uh, this is just an example that I've used in another context. It's where you build it from the ground up, the, the learning outcomes are defined, you, def you outline the pedagogical strategies and you go and you seek accreditation uh, for the program or you get permission to run the program. And in the earlier slides, I gave you two examples, one of the iSkull uh, model and the other was of the Gaeltic eHub model. And both of those would be high impact blend because there was a big impact or a high impact on the organizations that were offering those and a lot of planning um, and preparation had to go in. So I think this is a nice way to think of blended learning as we go forward. And ultimately, whatever kinds of blends that we put into action, I argue, would argue and others as well, that we would need, we need to prepare. And again, based on the Teach Nimble blended learning framework, we have developed this simple glance card and it allows teachers to think about what they're teaching. They get them to think about the uh, uh, learning types they want to use, gets them to think about what they will do before class, uh, what modalities they'll use, what kinds of learning types will they have, what technologies, etc. And they can add in lots of other ideas in here as well. And recently uh, some schools in Ireland have started using this. They have been um, embedding it into Teams as part of the Beadle app. And uh, it's very interesting and we're hoping to develop uh, this further. So ultimately, and I'm about to finish now, all of this is 
that there is no one size fits all when it comes to blended learning and that we really need to think about it on those three fronts where learning is going to happen, uh, the learning types that we want to um, put into our blend and also the technologies. And we need to think in a very holistic way um, when we are doing that. And that takes planning and it takes sharing. Trying to do this on your own, I think, is very, very difficult. And where I've seen it working really well is in schools where there is a culture of collaboration, where teachers are working with each other, where they're sharing their blends, where they're sharing what they have tried, what has worked and what has not worked. And it's also important that we learn from those things that did not work and a culture where failure or mistakes are actually looked on as positives rather than being afraid to make those mistakes, I think is really, really important. So I believe that the future is very much um, there for blended learning. I think blended learning is going to be something that we, we've we probably been using in the past, we didn't even know it, but we are definitely going to use it more and more in the future. And with the new range of tools and technologies that are coming our way, it is going to help us as teachers to design learning experiences that will truly benefit our students. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, we do have questions. There's a lot of questions popping up on the, on our chat and on, on our Padlet. And uh, but before uh, for the questions and answers, as I mentioned earlier, we also have a special guest to answer your questions and I would like to introduce her. Her name is Hannah Grainer Clemson, as I mentioned already from the European Commission. Hannah, thank you so much for being with us today as well. Hello, and, pleasure. Uh, and actually, I would like to start. So thank you, first of all, to all participants that already posed some questions, very, very interesting questions. I cannot promise that we will answer all of them, but we will do our best to answer the majority. And I would like actually to start um, with Hannah. Uh, we have some questions addressing specifically the commissioner, and one of which is uh, the import. It's related to the importance of the blended mobility in the new Erasmus Plus program. So let's fo focus first on the speech from the commissioner and try to address these questions. So. How important will it be the, the blended mobility in the new Erasmus Plus program? Uh, can you give us some examples of how this could be? Yes, combined? Abs yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's um, I think actually the uh, the development of Erasmus uh, program very much mirrors what Michael was uh, talking in that actually in a way a lot of this is not new. If we think about the way in which Erasmus projects work, you would um, in a strategic partnership project, get in touch with other schools in other countries, have a conversation online. You may meet up occasionally, but some of the work would take place in your school or in um, places around the town or the city, um, as we often see with Erasmus projects. So in that respect, um, I think Erasmus projects have been blended for quite a long time and um, particularly with language learning um, we've had some wonderful examples of um, classes actually coming together live and this was another example that Michael gave of um, uh, using the technology in order to actually meet pupils without actually having to travel this is of course where we link in with the with the green deal with our being conscious for the for the environment um so i think in that respect um thinking about different ways to engage but not miss out on that all important um engagement with learners with professionals um in other countries i think will be an incredibly part um, important part of the future program yes wonderful thank you so much hannah uh Still on that note, we also have another question and I'll just read it to make sure that I read it correctly. The proposed placing of teachers and teacher education at the heart of the new generation or is on Europe actions on the EEA is very welcome. Are you hopeful that these professionalizing conversations will lead to real empowerment and meaningful engagement for teachers at this important new frontier? Absolutely. I mean, I think that that question also picks up uh, what Michael was talking about at the end of his presentation there about the the, the crucial part of uh, professional learning and peer learning. But I think uh, for us in particular, it is sometimes quite easy to say we need more professional development. It, it's absolutely true, 
But what does that actually mean? And I think there's there's probably three parts to that. Firstly, you, there's a, a more formal approach perhaps to initial teacher education, to preparing future teachers, to professional development courses, um, those kinds of uh, opportunities that can be perhaps more structured, facilitated, guided. So that's one part. The second part of it would be the more informal exchange that it equally needs as much support to happen, um, which is your everyday conversations, your sharing of materials and so on, which is a crucial part of professional dialogue. But then I think the third part of it is um, to see this very much within the whole school ecosystem, that if this dialogue happens between professionals, there is perhaps a risk that it only stays at the teacher and school level. But what we want this kind of dialogue to be is actually filtering through different levels of the school system where uh, municipal authorities, where policymakers are able to listen um, to professionals, to their experiences, but also professionals can listen directly to the vision um, that those uh, that those people working in policy have and actually move on and evolve in their perspectives. So I think um, the important thing there is not to see professional development as just something that is done to or for teachers. It is about building communities and it's about building spaces for dialogue and absolutely ultimately if we want this bright future for blended learning as Michael says it needs to filter between different levels of the system. That's wonderful and you already replied to uh, several other questions on the <laughs> on the role of the blended learning in the future and uh, having well uh, everyone experienced the past year and uh, uh, the impact that uh, the, um, the different uh, well, the different circumstances that we lived uh, caused in the, in the school, but not only in the school, but also in the workplace. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And on that, I would like to now ask Michael another question. Um, somebody mentioned on this, the asked on the chat if blended learning could be described like personalized learning. What do you think about this? Um, yes, I mean, it can. I mean, it can definitely facilitate personalised learning. Definitely. I mean, I think there, the, what, it, what it does is it gives the, the teacher and also the learner more choices. So I think I've seen some really good examples over the last 12 months of particularly where, uh, you know, students or learners who may have um, uh, struggled previously uh, and got lost. They were they weren't identified, but teachers through formative assessment and other uh, strategies using a range of technologies have been able to identify who needs help and then work more individually with that learner. So yes, I think it can support more personalized learning, but that's not the whole story. Yeah. Of course, of course. In that sense, actually, we have another question that, which I think links very well with this one, which is what is the effect of blended education model on teachers success and motivation? Yeah, well, Does yeah, I, I, I well, look, I mean, I, I, I subscribe. I think this is about your beliefs and attitudes and mm -hmm. my belief. My belief is and I have seen this. I have been lucky to do to have worked with um, one of the working groups in the commission over the last number of years. I think I, my view of teachers is they are professionals. They are highly skilled individuals. They have a, a very highly developed uh, knowledge. And I think the uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Because I just lost it there for a second. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about the motivation or the motivation. Of the yes. yes. Yeah. So on the motivation side, I, I think that the blended learning provides opportunities for them to work in collaboration with their colleagues. And I think sometimes teaching can be quite an isolating profession, but I think with blended learning, sharing your stories, those professional conversations that Hannah referred to is mm -hmm. really, really important. And I was speaking with a deputy principal of a large school in Ireland today, a post primary school that's really doing fantastic work in the area of blended learning. And he said to me that at the moment, you know, they are at the stage where they've had some wonderful collaboration uh, across subject departments, but also they have digital uh, leadership teams within the school. And those conversations have really helped them to grow as a school. 
I think that and what he's saying to me now is his next step in his school is to move beyond that and actually to move outside his own school and to have more conversations. So I think it will be highly motivating for teachers because I think they will see that their practices are valid and that they can capture them. That's why I share the framework. I think we need frameworks so that we can capture those practices so that then we're, that we're all talking the same language and that we're not talking at cross purposes with each other. And if I could come in there, if that's OK, of course. Ruta, of course, I think um, uh, attitudes is not to put a, a negative um, slant on the discussion, but I think it is a serious challenge for us, given the diversity of experiences. Wouldn't you agree, Michael? And I I'm wondering what you you think yes. about um, the challenge of I know that some people might say, well, my school head isn't uh, very happy about the idea or our authorities don't seem to want our schools to be doing this or I have colleagues who are scared of innovating um, and I think that can uh, add to the pressures that are already felt and that's absolutely the last thing we would want and of course you we want to present a, a vision that is ambitious that is attractive um, and we want to be able to support that but I think we have to manage expectations don't we that yes. um, you know I think it's really important to support leaders to give to give some level of autonomy but also with guidance yes. that um, it's often the experience that it is that guides your attitude and I think that's where I found it really interesting that you were talking about low impact for the school or the teacher um, where if you can make start to make small changes and have yes. small positive experiences that might lead to something bigger in the future. I think for us also there's a, a need to perhaps to look outside the education system yes. um, that to put the whole responsibility on schools is perhaps not the right approach to say schools you must go out and find a museum to work with you must go out and find all of these contacts to find all of these other professionals to engage with i think we need investment and a bit more of a wider societal approach to this to um for them to meet in the middle to actually come together to have things that are mutually beneficial uh, for these cultural organisations, for these sports organisations, for all of these different places, for these forests and parks uh, who are wanting to engage young people um, in uh, in uh, sustainability projects or whatever it is. I think, uh, as the Commissioner said, this kind of um, way of coming together of education with other sectors in order to help young people to see the relevance of their learning, to make it meaningful in practice um, is, is hugely important. So um, I wondered what you also thought of those dealing with those slightly negative or fearful um, experiences. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, no, and I, I'm in, I'm in violent agreement with what you have just said. I mean, I, I think that that is what it's about. And um, I, I, I think the idea of the low impact blend is actually a nice idea, and I'm borrowing that obviously from Alamira and his colleague and 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 the colleagues there. But I think it's something that we are actually going to build on because I, I have met many teachers who are wonderful, wonderful teachers, and I actually wrote a piece in one of our own newspapers this time last year, where you know a good teacher all of a sudden. Um, cast into the emergency remote teaching um, who never used digital that much was 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 fearful and there was a lot of anxiety etc. So I think we need to have that low impact blend and we need to support teachers and actually a key question in all of this for me um, e either to, you know and it goes well beyond blended learning is why bother why and I think this is the key question teachers should ask. I, I like in the Nordic countries, uh, Bildung and uh, sorry now for my poor pronunciation, but this critical look at digital technologies in teaching, learning and assessment. And ultimately, I think that is what we need to be getting at here. And that's where I'm going with the TPAC idea that that our teachers, we support them. And I agree with you, Hannah. It's much more than just uh, a one off course. Uh, you know, it could be professional conversations. It could be bite sized. Uh, um, uh, professional learning and there's a wonderful document from the JRC on this. So I think we need we need lots of supports in there and it's going to take people. Everybody is going to go on this journey uh, at a different pace and we just need to make sure that at the school level we're not leaving people behind either. 
Thank you so much. And maybe we can still um, stay on you, Michael, to answer the next question. And then I'll pass the floor because I want to ask this question to both of you. Um, it's actually a very interesting question, which puts uh, the person that asked, I'm sorry, I, uh, it was not mentioned who asked this question, so I cannot refer to the person. But this person put herself in a position like, how can, what can I do uh, to support uh, this opening up of the education through bl blended learning in an institutional framework. Um, so if you had to give some recommendations to our listeners today, uh, everyone that is listening from, I uh, actually can see that we have some people from formal learning and non-formal learning as well. So everyone that is listening to us, what can they do in practical terms to support this opening up of the education area to blended learning? Yeah, so I think the first thing that they that they need to do is actually to sit down and reflect on what has happened during emergency remote teaching. I think that is the first thing that we need to reflect. We need to look at what has been going on. Again, I have been doing this myself with educators, quite a lot of them actually in the further education and training space in recent months, and we have been reflecting and we have been using the, the framework, uh, the six learning uh, types and looking at what we were doing and then looking at some of the tools and the technologies. So I would start there and I would start by making those low impact blends. How can you start to move things out? And ultimately it's about purpose, Ruta. It's about purpose. What is the purpose? And one once you become more comfortable and more familiar, then you can extend it out. But I think let's walk before we run. Thank you so much. Hannah, what do you think about this? Yes, I mean, I would absolutely uh, echo what Michael has said there about the need to, to start small, the, the also the, the need to, to really think what is best for our learners, for our community. Um, this is, again, as you, as you said, this there is no one size fits all um, and that would be certainly from the school perspective I think if I was to then shift that to what could we the commission do um, I think there is certainly um, uh, there are certainly tools that we already have and things that we could develop we know that we could develop to directly help schools such as the selfie tool which is a self-assessment tool for schools to understand better understand their digital capacity and the new uh, tool that we're developing specifically for teachers that can help them to understand where they're at um, and where they actually want to go to in the future as professionals and we also have other tools relating to inclusion um, and they, those are available uh, on the school education gateway, which can help with the dialogue that needs to happen anyway. But I think there are tools that uh, that we can provide, and these are all based on research evidence, based on um, uh, even ministry dialogue uh, that that I think are actually can be quite useful as well. So we recognise that, but of course, it's ultimately about helping systems to help schools, to help teachers, to help learners. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a lot of questions on uh, the need of having infrastructures uh, that support um, um, this path. And uh, basically, they are asking how can they reach out to these infrastructures? As I understand from your comments and your answers, first, we need to start this dialogue and then we can implement the infrastructures. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, on this, and actually there's already some infrastructures and maybe I don't know who wants to answer first this question, but actually it was addressed to Michael, but uh, let's see, <laughs> we can have both answering the question is, um, we already have some infrastructures, infrastructure, sorry, uh, in place that may support uh, part of this development. Of course, there's a lot that still need to be done uh, in the different systems. But uh, Michael, based on your experiences down the years, and this was this question was uh, posed by Connor Galvin from Dublin, uh, mm. what would you see as the most useful role of the initial teacher education, university teachers, faculties, colleges of education, etc.? What would be the most useful role that they can play in relation to the challenges facing schools in terms of quality blended learning? Well, I know Connor of old, so uh, of course he'd asked me that hard question. Um, yeah, I, it's a great question. I mean, I think I think actually, um, and Connor was was with me um, on one of the Delta events where we actually looked at teacher education. I, I think initial teacher education is very important in all of this. And I think ultimately we need um, uh, 
those coming out of initial teacher education to be really critical of, you know, using the tools, getting as many opportunities to try them out, but also to, you know, to look at them and see where they're actually having an impact and, you know, ultimately that they're enhancing the students' learning. I think if we can start to look at that and help them to develop those, uh, the, the skills because they need to know how to use the tools, but more importantly, how to use those tools if they're teaching English or Spanish or French or mathematics and to really look at it and see what they're what what they're designing and how it's impact on learners and to have some rubrics and frameworks to even start making decisions. I know they'll be early in their careers, but they, this this critical critical uh, users of digital is I think what I'd love to see coming out of all of our initial teacher education programs. Wonderful. Hannah, would you like to add something? Yes, if I can quickly add, there are there are three things that spring to mind about both about professional um, development, but also about infrastructure. One of those is that uh, absolutely the the expertise that's in offering in higher education uh, because of their research, but also because they naturally have been um, part of uh, training teachers for a long time, um, is that they are able to even support the professional learning of, for example, museum educators or musicians or dancers or um, uh, sports professionals to help them to understand uh, learning um, as an as I suppose as an art or a science, if you could call uh, teaching and learning that. Um, a great example is again from Ireland, their creative schools program where they actually, it wasn't just about putting artists into schools for a period of time to work in different environments and in different ways, but they actually gave them a period of training to understand teaching and learning better. And I know it's also been done um, in other countries as well. Another example is actually from sport. Um, I know it from Flanders uh, education system here in Belgium about uh, there have been football initiatives where you actually working with and that includes um, financial support for sports organizations to actually work with young people who are not spending the whole time in school but actually encouraging them to follow their academic studies alongside um, sports training which has proved to be incredibly effective for those for those young people. And then another example that we have is just simply paying for buses to go somewhere. That, um, as I we heard in a, in a recent webinar um, with, uh, it was an international webinar, many countries were saying that is a simple gift to schools that can have an incredibly high impact. Just the ability to take uh, young people who would not normally have the opportunity to go somewhere and learn in a different environment with their teachers, so it's all very still structured, um, has been, uh, has had a huge impact um, on, on the way in which schools can give more variety to the learning and give more meaning to the learning. So absolutely, I mean, these things have to go hand in hand. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, I see a lot of comments on the chat. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, answer all of them. Um, but uh, uh, to launch my last question for, to both of you, uh, and maybe we can start uh, with Michael again and then finalize with Hannah. Um, sometimes when we hear new things, and this is just my consideration, uh, when we hear new things or new approaches or a different path, of course, all the obstacles based on our old habits come up. Uh, so we see already a lot of obstacles and we don't see exactly how to, you know, overcome those obstacles. Um, so in your view, leaving a message to all of our uh, attendees today, which actually we have a great audience. Thank you so much for your commitment and engagement. Um, what would be what would be your main message in terms of biggest opportunity and benefits to uh, use a blended approach? Well, and it actually goes back to an earlier question that that, that I thought of the, an answer to afterwards. I, I think it goes back to the learners. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some of the feedback that I have been looking at from learners across the, 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 the sectors from higher education down to further education and to the schools, I gave you some feedback earlier from a, a school that I was talking to today, is that actually 
learners, even though they they really missed not being in school with their pals and meeting their teachers and looking them in the in the eye and all the rest of it and, and the masks and all that, they did not like that. But they really liked some of the flexibility uh, that was given to them by some of the blends that they encountered during emergency remote teaching. Um, I think they liked that control over, you know, when they were going to learn and how they were going to learn and what they were going to learn. So I think these are these are where I would start with actually. And, you know, I when I said about asking your teachers how they got on, I'd also ask your learners, what do they, what do they, what was the experience like? What were the things that they liked and would they like to continue? And what were the things they definitely don't want to see again? So I, I think that my message is focus on the learners. Wonderful, thank you so much. What about you, Hannah? Oh gosh, how to how to bring it down to, to one thing. I think um, I'm going to go back to something that I heard an Estonian school head uh, say in a, in a very um, early visit in my career as part of the European Commission is that his question is always how do I make my pupils happy and I think out of all of this really well-being and actually being happy feeling safe feeling confident as a professional learner or as a young learner in school in schools that can often be as volatile as the home can be how can we actually make that a better, um, more positive experience? I think that really has to guide um, anything, any change um, in education. Um, but I think Blended really still um, has the has the opportunity to support that. That's wonderful. And I think it's a great note of inspiration to finalize our webinar. Uh, we are already a few minutes ahead of our time, but I think it was a wonderful conversation. I really want to thank uh, both Hannah and Michael for staying uh, a little bit longer and answering all of these questions and engaging in this interesting conversation. I would like uh, to ask you please don't forget to complete the feedback survey but i also would like to remind you that this webinar is part of a series of professional development opportunities on blended learning that the school education gateway is uh, promoting and you can actually enroll in a massive open online course uh, called bridging distance and uh, in school learning blended learning in practice to gain a deeper understanding of purpose, process and benefits of blended learning. So actually, if you didn't see some of your questions answered uh, in this webinar and you really want to uh, dig in uh, more in this topic, please enroll in this massive open online course uh, is free and starts on Monday, the 29th of March um, and open to teachers and school stakeholders from any country. So uh, I would like to wish you all a great afternoon and once more thank uh, Michael Hallisey and Hannah Clemson for being with us today and of course our commissioner for uh, the great opening that we had. It was a lovely uh, end of afternoon and I wish you a good day. <laughs>